Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Lonsbury and I work on the alumni team here at McMaster. Although we cannot organize events that bring people together in person, we're happy that our alumni and friends can join us online no matter where they are. For this wellness webinar this afternoon, I'd like to introduce you to McMaster alumnus Sachin Patel, a graduate of McMaster's Faculty of Social Science with honors in kinesiology, doctor of chiropractic from New York Chiropractic College and certified functional medicine provider, Sachin is a father, husband, philanthropist, functional medicine practice success coach, speaker, author, and founder of the Living Proof Institute. Speaking to us today on how to create balance, create and balance mental and emotional health, as well as discover simple strategies to reduce anxiety and learn how to better manage stress naturally, please welcome Sachin. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you to my fellow alumnus. It's such an honor to be here and uh, share this powerful information with you, especially right now, because we're all dealing with some form of stressor. And what I want to do is provide you with some really practical tools that you can implement immediately uh, to cultivate a state of being more calm, a state of being more creative, a state of being more in the highest version of you uh, that you know is available to you and accessible to you if you can get into the right state. So I want you to have fun today. I want you to listen for yourself, but I also want you to listen as if you're going to teach this information to somebody else. And I find when we teach what you learn today to other people, it holds us accountable and it allows us to also help improve uh, those around us. So I want to make sure I cover as much information as I can. So I'm going to get started uh, right away so that we can have some amazing, profound shifts in your knowledge and understanding and awareness of your own self. I mean, it's amazing to me how amazing uh, you are. And today, what I want to do is celebrate that. So we're going to talk about cultivating a daily practice and really how to thrive in uncertain times. And here's something that I want you to know times are always uncertain unless we can be in a state of certainty. So today I'm going to help you cultivate more certainty uh, in your life. I want you to take great notes. And what that means to me is write down the things that really resonate and really speak to you today. I don't expect you to apply everything I talk to you about today, uh, today or even tomorrow, maybe over time but pick the things that you know are going to resonate with you and be prepared to listen to this talk maybe even a few more times to get the most out of it. One of my mentors, Ram Das, taught me that it's important to be here now. So if you've taken the time out of your day to register for this, to be here in this moment, be here. So turn off all distractions, You know, turn off anything that's going to pull you away from this. Uh, shut the door if you need to. Be present and be here. Take notes. And I promise you, you're going to walk away with something that's going to be powerfully shifting uh, for you. So this is a piece of uh, art from Alex Gray in honor of uh, Richard Alpert, who studied some of the things we're going to talk about today in, at Harvard University. So it's pretty profound. So question for you is, why are you here? What is it that brought you? And I'd love for you to share this in the chat, if you would, you know, what brought you here today? What was it that you were hoping to learn? And really having that information helps me help you get the most out of today's presentation. This is a topic that I could speak about for eight hours, and I have spoken about it for eight hours uh, to a group of my colleagues. So it's something that's near and dear to me. I'm going to share with you really the tip of the iceberg, but you're going to get more out of this if I understand why you're here. Just a little bit about me. This is me on the left. This is my beautiful son in the middle, Devin. He's about 10. And my lovely wife, Deepa, on the right, who also went to McMaster University. So we're fellow alumnus, and uh, it's always great to be able to contribute back uh, into our community. Really quickly, I want to share my values with you because this will be relevant a little bit later in our conversation. My values are the following. First one and foremost is love, honesty, transparency, integrity, excellence, growth, time in nature, empathy, consistency, community, freedom, timeless wisdom, and paying it forward. So when I practice my daily routine, when I go through my day, my week, my month, I'm holding these values in my highest regard. And anything that violates these values is going to create stress in my life. And so 
I encourage all of you to have documented somewhere, not just in your mind, but write it down. What are your values? What are the things and the directions that you want to move in in everything that you do? What are the values that you lead with? And ask yourself, are the things that you're doing, the people that you're hanging out with, the TV shows that you might be watching, the radio program you might be listening to, the websites that you're surfing, are they in alignment with your highest values? Because if they're not, they're, they're going to create an imbalance in your life. And an imbalance in your values creates a very, very a big ripple in your life in terms of stress uh, goes as well. So part of creating a daily practice is knowing what your values are. And it's also about having a personal health philosophy that really is something that you can align with. So the reason people ask about how can I handle stress better is because they want better health. They want more creativity. They want to be around longer for their family. They want to be more present for their families. And that really starts with a health philosophy because our body is going to do all these things for us. So my personal health philosophy is that we must love ourselves to life. So really to me, being healthy is an act of self-love, getting towards you know, better balance and homeostasis and being, you know, resilient in the face of stressors is an act of self-love to get to that point. And really, you know, I see people loving themselves to death. I want you to start loving yourself to life. This is a very important mental shift, if you will, in how you look at the act of becoming healthy and becoming the best version of you. It comes from a place of love. So you have to truly and deeply love yourself in order to take the actions and to cultivate a daily practice. So it starts there. Okay. And I want you to really feel that and embrace that. I also believe that nothing can fix your body better than it can fix itself. Your body literally built itself. And during this conversation, billions of cells in your body will die and will replace themselves. Literally billions. This will happen silently. You're a hologram of life. You're dying and being reborn in every single moment of your life. And your body is doing this for you in every single moment. So we have to honor that. And when we can honor that, that wisdom, that deep wisdom that lives inside each and every one of ourselves cells, then we can actually tap into it. Okay. So if we believe the body can fix itself and nothing can do it better then that's where we're going to look first, instead of looking there last. And that's what it means to be in a state of homeostasis and balance. That's where we want to get to. Your cells, all 70 trillion of them, are the highest form of known intelligence in the entire cosmos. You are literally animated Earth. So within each and every one of your cells is the brilliance of the entire universe. If one cell from your body was found in outer space, it would be the greatest discovery of our lifetime. So what I'm going to teach you how to do is to control those cells under your own volition, which we have the capability of doing. What I believe is that you are the doctor of the future. This is my son, and this is us in Costa Rica on a healing uh, retreat where I was teaching. So I believe that ultimately the solution to our healthcare system is more healthy citizens. And then if we can learn how to take care of ourselves, just like you're interested in learning how to manage your stress, then this is the solution. So we are the doctors of the future. And health really is a combination of things. It's a good history, it's accountability, it's coaching, it's mindset, lifestyle, you know, balanced hormones, fasting, data, microbiome health, and a reward system. So these are all the functions of health. This is important to understand because to be healthy is to have balance and homeostasis in the body. So things that can throw us out of homeostasis and out of balance and create stress in our body are things like inflammation, our environment, toxicity, a lack of purpose, you know, sedentary lifestyle, relationships. These are things that can create stress that can later uh, result in illness and disease. So a question that comes up for me often, I've worked with thousands of people and I fly all over the world giving this message is how fast can I heal? And so this chart here is really fascinating because you can see that the cells in the lining of your digestive system heal every two to four days. They turn over every two to four days. You have a whole new lining of your digestive system. Your stomach cells replace themselves every seven or every two to nine days. So about every week you have new stomach cells. So you can heal really, really fast, but what throws us away from healing and moves us away from the direction of healing and repair and regeneration is stress. Okay. So building and repairing and regenerating is what turns off when we stay in a chronic state of stress. So these processes slow down or become less effective because our body goes into a state of survival. And when it does that, then it 
doesn't allow us to heal as fully and as deeply as we'd like to. So this is why getting into a more relaxed state, a more balanced state, what we call a parasympathetic state is extremely valuable for you. I also want you to understand that you are both hardware and software. You are more than your lab work. You are more than your bone scan. You are more than an X-ray or an MRI. There's more to you than that. There's a part of you that I would equate to the software of a computer. It's the things that we can't see, but create the function and create the instruction set for the hardware. Okay. So there's two parts to us, two distinct parts to us that we must learn how to take good care of. What's really fascinating about our bodies is that the the hardware is built by the software, okay? So the intelligence and the coding and the information comes from this software to build new tissues and new structures in your body and to heal and repair and to restore normal function. So knowing this is very critical. How you're feeling is how you're healing. How you're feeling is how you're healing. How you feel is deterministic in the state of physiology that you're in, which is deterministic in where blood is going in your body, which determines what organs and systems are healing and repairing in your body. So I want you to understand this because uh, the next few slides are gonna, gonna really help you understand uh, why this is so critical. Our environment, our beliefs, our values, and even our past experiences are key determinants to our stress response. Our environment, our beliefs, values, and past experiences are key determinants to our stress response. This means that two people could be undergoing the exact same situation and have completely different interpretations of the situation at a physiological and emotional level because of their past experiences, because of their value system, okay? Somebody who has an abundance mindset is going to react differently than somebody who has a scarcity mindset. And a scarcity mindset may come from past experiences from our parents, or it might come from past experiences in our own personal life, right? Some, of, some people may have lost a job in the past, or some people may have lost a loved one in the past. So these experiences shape how we interpret what's happening in this present moment. And understanding this is vital because sometimes we fight the past and we haven't moved on from the past. And that can lead to changes in our emotional health, whether that be anxiety uh, or depression. So it's critical to understand that we are hardware and software and that our past beliefs, values, and experiences and the existing environment in combination is what ultimately results in our stress response. There's a part of our brain called the amygdala. And I'm gonna keep this really simple. The part of our brain called the amygdala is part of our, our reptilian brain. So it is constantly surveying information from your environment, the smells, uh, or, or sorry, the sights that are coming in, the sounds that are coming in, the feelings that are coming in from touch receptors. All of that information goes into a part of our brain called the amygdala, which then has to make a decision whether you're in a stressful environment or not. A simple example would be if a lion were to walk into my office right now, I would have an immediate stress response and I would want that because that would help me survive. If a two-year-old was in this room and a lion walked in, they might walk towards the lion because of their past experiences or their beliefs or their values at that age may be different than yours. Completely same, same situation, com radically different response in the body. So why is this important? This is important because anytime we go into a stress response, we actually send blood away from our organs. So let me give you an example. When you're at rest, so let's say you're sleeping or you're resting, you're reading a book, you're relaxing, 50% of your blood goes to your liver and kidneys, 50%. When you're under stress, only about 5% of your blood goes to your liver and kidneys. So you must be asking, well, where does that blood go? When we're healing, repairing, regenerating, the blood goes to our trunk, it goes to our liver, it goes to our stomach, it goes to our small intestine. It's used to make enzymes uh, to digest our food. It's used to filter our blood so that we can have, uh, you know, we can make urine and we can make uh, stool. So all of these processes that are required for us to properly uh, function happen in the trunk. This is also where most diseases start. Most diseases start in the trunk, right? They start like in the liver or in the stomach or in the intestines or in the heart. 
uh, or in the kidneys or in the reproductive organs, it's because these organs require adequate blood flow. When we're stressed out, we're not sending blood or as, mu as much blood as we could be and should be to these organs. The stress response immediately increases our heart rate, increases glucose production, shuts off detoxification, shuts off digestion, shuts off motility, shuts off reproduction, shuts off kidney function. All of these things that are normal processes shut down because our body goes into a state of survival. Now, whether we go into that fight or flight state, again, is dependent on our interpretation of whatever environment or situation we are in and our attitude towards that situation. So we can be, uh, you know, programmed to react a certain way based on our upbringing. And this is an important part to understand because if I give you a breathwork exercise to do and you use that breathwork exercise as a fire extinguisher to put out an over uh, and uh, abnormal stress response, I'm not really helping you because you're always gonna start that fire or respond to that condition, respond to that environment, respond to that thought, and then you're gonna use something to put the fire out. I wanna give you these tools to build you up beyond that. So some, some of you may need to do deeper work, some emotional work, some you know past uh, life regression type of work or some hypnosis. There's other ways to access these parts of your brain that will help you uh, address these maybe, some, maybe sometimes seemingly irrational responses that you might have. Things that you don't want to trigger you anymore can be triggered at a subconscious level. So even thinking about it isn't enough. We've got to go deeper to find some of those answers. So this is your sympathetic response. This is a survival response is absolutely normal, absolutely essential to send blood to the arms and legs so I can run away from the lion. I hope this is all making sense. Now, what's really cool about our body is that we have one nerve, okay, that does that when it's stimulated, turns off this entire stress response and creates a healing response and takes you from a fight or flight response into a state of rest and digest and repair and regeneration. It's called cranial nerve number 10 or the vagus nerve. Vagus means wanderer. So this nerve starts in our brainstem and goes through, goes to all of our organs. It goes to all of our trunk organs, our small intestine, stomach, large intestine, goes to our salivary glands in our mouth, goes to our lungs, goes to our heart, our reproductive organs. And this uh, nerve, when it's properly stimulated, properly functioning, will actually slow down our heartbeat. It will stimulate digestion. It will stimulate gallbladder uh, secretions. It'll stimulate healthy uh, dilation of the blood vessels to the digestive system so we can properly digest the food that we're eating to get the nutrition from it. It helps improve reproductive health. So we want all of this. People come to us from all over the world. They fly from all over the world to hear exactly what I'm telling you right now, because once you see the importance of this, I hope you don't unsee it. And what I hope you do is understand how simple it is. So if I could teach you how to stimulate this nerve and turn on all the healing responses in your body, would that be of interest to you? Go ahead and type that into the chat. Humor me if you would like to know how to stimulate this nerve so that you can accelerate and promote your healing. Okay, so I see lots of yeses uh, coming in. Thank you. Okay, this is the, if you understand this and you apply this daily and moment to moment, you will be in a state of health that you've never been before because of this awareness that you have. This promotes deep healing in your body. This promotes everything that you're looking for exists on the right side of this chart. We can't heal when we're not sending blood to our digestive system. I don't care what supplements you take, you can't heal if you're not sending blood to the appropriate body part. Where we send flow is where we send function. And this is all tied to our stress response. That's why it's important that we understand the significance of this. That's why I'm spending a few minutes here. So we call this concept autonomic pairing. What that means is we wanna pair your autonomic nervous system with the activity. So really simple question, if I wanna digest my food, where should I be sending blood? I should be sending it to my digestive system. Now, if I'm sending blood to my digestive system, I can stimulate an increase in blood flow to my digestive system by putting my body into a state of rest and digest. And I'm gonna show you by the end of this talk exactly 
how to do that. So we want to pair our nervous system with the function. If I'm running away from a lion, I want blood going to my arms and legs. If I am digesting my meal, I want blood going to my gut. Okay. Really simple concept, but very often overlooked. The things that are simple are often ignored. Now, Steve Jobs and Leonardo da Vinci said that the greatest sign of sophistication is simplicity. So sometimes the simplest solutions, because of our sophisticated hardware and software in our body, the solutions for us can be very simple. As I said, where you send flow is where you send function. So let's talk about cultivating. Now that you have this understanding, let's talk about cultivating uh, you know, health like, through a daily practice, you know, in any times, whatever they might be. First and foremost is to connect with nature. This is so simple to do, but so simple not to do. Now, without going into all the mathematical reasons to go into nature, because there are many, there's emotional reasons to go into nature. The trees, for example, release essential oils, which, which create a parasympathetic response in our body. The visuals, uh, the forest is a fractal forest. So it's when we see fractals, our brain being a fractal, it promotes healing and relaxation in our body. Sitting in nature is one of the best things that you can do to put you into an environment that promotes healing, repair, regeneration, restoration. Okay, it takes us away from electromagnetic signals, it takes us away from distractions, and it brings us into the present moment. So connection with nature is vital. Now, if you might live in a city or you might uh, not have access to the outdoors right now, there are strategic times that you may want to consider being outdoors. Some of the best times to be outdoors are in the morning during sunrise. This increases a hormone in our body called dopamine. Dopamine, or it's a neurotransmitter. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that helps increase our motivation, our focus, and our sense of reward. In the morning, we also, when we're exposed to sunlight, get, we'll get a stimulation uh, from the sunlight to increase cortisol. Cortisol increases energy in our body. So we need that. Cortisol is highest in the morning. We don't want it in the evenings. We want it to go down in the evenings. We want it more so in the morning. So morning sunlight, even if it's cloudy outside, go outside when the sun comes up, that's going to be a powerful determinant. And that's really simple to do. Okay. Uh, even on a cloudy day, you're getting hundreds of and hundreds of times more light exposure and brightness than you would from a light bulb in your house. The next important time to go outside if you're available is at noon. At noon, the sun is in its highest position. This stimulates serotonin production. Serotonin production helps us feel good. And when we feel good, we do good. Serotonin also helps us digest our food and helps promote motility in our digestive system. And then in the evening, if you can watch the sunset, okay, then that's also going to be helpful because it tells your body to shift gears, to shut off cortisol production and increase melatonin production. Melatonin is one of our most important immunomodulating hormones. So if you want to help have a healthy immune system, then melatonin is something that you want to produce, but you don't produce it if you're exposed to artificial light. So our TVs and our screens and things like that can be detrimental to our circadian rhythm. Circadian means that the levels fluctuate throughout the day. So you see cortisol is highest in the morning and it should be lowest in the evening. Melatonin is lowest during the day and highest in the evening. And this allows for physical and psychological and deep repair to take place. Now, if we don't get a good night's rest, we're going to have to make more cortisol, which we typically associate with stress. We're going to have to make more cortisol in order to, you know, be able to function the next day. Now, cortisol's main function in our body isn't as a stress responder. It's actually to raise blood sugar. Okay. So cortisol, when it increases, raises blood sugar. When we're feeling tired and we need more energy, we have to raise blood sugar more. Cortisol is antagonistic to melatonin. So you can't have high cortisol, high stress, and high melatonin at the same time. So stress is a natural immunosuppressant. So this is why, again, it's important for us to strategically time outdoor exposure to create these physiological hormonal shifts in our body. And your body's been doing this and animals have been doing this from the beginning of time. So this is the natural coding that we can tap into. There's a natural rhythm to the planet that we can tap into. The next way to help reduce stress and balance your life is to create meaningful connections and community. So being on a community like this 
is very powerful because you know that everyone here is interested in improving their quality of life through stress reduction, through meaningful shifts in their health, maybe meaningful shifts in the way they perceive things. So this is a great community of people who are like-minded. The word in Sanskrit is satsang. Sat means truth and sang means fellowship. So find your fellowship, the fellowship that aligns with the values that we discussed earlier. So I want to hang around with people and have meaningful connections and conversations in a community-like setting, whether that's online like this, or you know, eventually what, whether, whether that could be in person or in small groups, find those people. This is a time where we really get to pick and choose who is important to us and who we want to actually spend time with. Okay. So, you know, take some time to reflect on that. You know, maybe look at your speed dial and change who's on your speed dial. Maybe take a look at, you know, um, the relationships that you have and, and evaluate them. You should be because one of the biggest sources of stress and poor health is a lack of community, a lack of belonging. You know, one of the greatest punishments that we can give to a prisoner is not putting them in jail. It's putting them in solitary confinement. So you want to be able to connect with other people and especially those who align with your values. Another important tool for you is to know your love language. You know, if you're in a relationship, uh, even, even at work, if you're, you want to have like friendly relationships with other people, uh, reward people. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're the boss, if you're the manager, get to know people's love languages. So Gary Chapman wrote a great book called The Five Love Languages. And what we found, what we find in our practice is that many people struggle in their relationships because they love the other person, but don't know how to love the other person. So my wife, for example, her love language is acts of service and quality time. So if I, as long as I spend some time with her and uh, take out the garbage, vacuum, clean up after myself, I'm filling up her love buckets. My love buckets, on the other hand, are physical touch and words of affirmation. So she has to say nice things and maybe give me a hug uh, once in a while. And that fills my love bucket up. Okay, so knowing that helps us love on each other a little bit more, and it creates more bliss in our relationship. And, you know, if you're living with other people, if you're working with other people, get to know these people so that you know how to show them your sense of appreciation and you know how to be appreciated. Right now, some of us might be living in close quarters or spending more time with people than we have in the past. Getting to know this about them can be extremely, extremely powerful. The next tip for stress reduction is really nutrient assimilation. So there's three key nutrients, which I'll tell you about in just a minute, that help our body deal with stress better. Now, before I ever recommend to my clients to start taking supplements, I recommend that they work on improving and optimizing digestion. Remember, if I'm sending blood flow to my digestive system, okay, I'm in a parasympathetic relaxed state. Now, most people who have digestive challenges do not get into that state before they have a meal. What they do is they eat uh, under stressful conditions. So they're engulfing their meal and therefore they're not producing adequate enzymes to digest and fully absorb the nutrition from that meal, which can then lead to, you know, further lead to nutrient deficiencies. So there's five golden rules to improving uh, digestion, optimizing nutrient assimilation, which then helps our body in, in the billions of things that it does, but particularly in stress management. So the first thing is we have to choose foods for who we want to become and how we want to feel. Okay, so I choose food for how I'm going to feel after I've had the meal. That's what I think about. I always think a little a step ahead. You know, yes, it might taste good to have this meal, but how am I going to feel after? And if it tastes good and I'm going to feel good about myself afterwards, that's the meal I choose. Okay, I always want to choose who I want to become in the future because my food becomes me. My food becomes my neurotransmitters. My food becomes my brain chemistry. So choosing that food makes a huge difference. The next thing I want to do is I want to chew that food. Chewing that food creates a relaxation response in my body. It signals through specific reflexes in the brain and in the digestive organs to let my body know food is coming, start sending blood to the trunk. If you don't chew your food, you do not send that signal. So make sure that you're chewing your food 30 to 40 times, okay, is, is the trick. Then you got to chill. You got to make sure you're relaxed. So if you're stressed out while you're eating, where is blood going? Not to your gut. And this can create digestive disruption, bloating, you know, heartburn, all kinds of other issues that tie back to poor autonomic pairing. 
The next thing is cherish. You know, I have immense gratitude for every meal that I have. And I give a moment to think about who grew that food for me, how it was transported to me, who prepared it for me, who dished it for me. Um, if I'm at a restaurant, I think about all those things. And it takes literally five seconds for, for you to do that and acknowledge that. But it puts my body into the right emotional state. You know, I'm thinking about other people and I'm having gratitude, which shifts my physiology into a parasympathetic state. And the last one is check. So most of you should be having a bowel movement one to three per day is healthy. You want to keep an eye on your digestive system. If there's anything funky going on, then you may not be absorbing the nutrients adequately that you're eating. So make sure that you're checking that. Now, the biggest, the, one of the biggest systems that's affected by stress is digestion. So a lot of times when people come to us, you know, they're having digestive disruption, heartburn, bloating, gas, whatever it might be, IBS, Crohn's, colitis. And the first question we ask them is about stress. We don't ask them about their food. We ask them what's stressing them out because it usually shows up there first. Three key nutrients um, you really want to pay attention to. One is magnesium. The other one is vitamin C. And the other one is a B complex. So check with your doctor if, if that's right for you to look into. And here's why. Magnesium, vitamin C, and B vitamins help us break down our stress hormones. So stress is not just an emotion. Stress is an emotion which turns into a chemistry, and then that chemistry has to then be metabolized. So if we make stress hormones, we have to break down those stress hormones so they're no longer creating stress in our body. And the nutrients that are responsible for that are magnesium, vitamin C, and a good B complex. So if you can, I don't want to expect you to read this, but this is what we call the methylation pathways. And what we'll see kind of in the bottom middle is that uh, our catecholamines, adrenaline and noradrenaline require B vitamins, they require magnesium, and they require vitamin C in order for them to be broken down properly. So sometimes if we have a deficiency in those nutrients, because we're not, because we're stressed out, we're not eating well, we're becoming more deficient. And when we're, and the more stress we have, the more it depletes these nutrients, it's kind of a downward spiral. So pay attention uh, and ask your doctor for the appropriate testing, because it could create kind of a, you know, a lot of anxiety for some people when they become magnesium deficient. Another thing I suggest is putting your heart into it. There's a device that I wear. Um, and my wife that uses this every day, it's called heart math. And what it is, is a small device that I clip to my ear. And what I'm able to do is I'm actually able to look at something called heart coherence and heart rate variability. I'll use this tool to then use my breathing to then get me into a parasympathetic state. So the bridge between the stress response and the relaxation response is your breath. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So we can actually use our breathing to get our physiology in the right state. And we can measure if we're in the right state of physiology using a device called the inner balance by heart math. So this is a great tool. It's relatively inexpensive. You connect it to your phone and it allows you to take your meditation and, and a breath work practice so much deeper and five to 10 minutes a day is what we suggest a couple minutes in the morning and a few minutes in the evening. And it's going to really get you in tune. It's kind of like tuning your guitar. Okay. Uh, and getting you into the right awareness of your own physiology and how you can control it. All right. Now we talked about the vagus nerve and how to stimulate it. So let me teach you how to stimulate your vagus nerve. One is to speak your truth. So when we speak, we actually create a mechanical vibration of that nerve. This is why when we talk to other people, we feel good. So when you talk to somebody about your problems versus texting them or emailing them about your problems, there's actually a mechanical vibration of that vagus nerve that stimulates you feeling more relaxed and you feeling better. Another way to stimulate the vagus nerve is by gargling. So every morning you can gargle the alphabet, you know, maybe two times, as and put as much water in there as you can in a safe way uh, and start gargling the alphabet. If you do that one to two times, you might get a little bit of tearing. That's okay. That's normal. It means you're stimulating that vagus nerve because where the vagus nerve attaches to the brainstem is right next to the part of the brainstem that causes uh, tears in our eyes. So that's how you know you're doing it effectively. The next thing you can do is hum. Humming and singing and chanting also stimulate the vagus nerve. So this is if you if you do prayer, if you sing, if you chant, like if you follow me home from dropping my son off in the morning, I'm chanting and singing all the way home 
for a half hour ride because this puts me in a more joyful state and it stimulates my vagus nerve in a mechanical way. So very powerful thing that you can do. And you can do this anywhere. You can do it in the shower. You can do it at your desk. You can hum wherever you are. If you're in the woods, you can hum and you can stack this on top of other things that you might be doing. Now, another big part of, of, of uh, reducing stress in your life is understanding communication styles. One of the keys that you might uh, that might be overlooked is communication style. So we use something called the DISC behavior system. You can get the book, a great book written by Robert Rome, and it's called Positive Personality Profiles. It dives deeper into this. When you understand how you like to be communicated to and other people like to be communicated to, you can be far more effective. And miscommunication is a huge form of stress in people's lives. Something can be said the wrong way and or misinterpreted because the wrong words were used or the wrong, um, you know, the emphasis was incorrectly fo uh, 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 focused. And that could lead to a lot of stress for people. So we find that when we make people aware of their communication styles, especially couples or teams, then they are far more effective at communicating with one another and things don't get taken personally because you could say something and trigger somebody and based on their current state, their environment in their home or you know wherever they might be going, their past experiences, that could all trigger them to go into this downward spiral of stress and we don't wanna be the source of that. So learn how to effectively communicate with other people using this. And if you work on teams or if you're uh, living with somebody like a, like a spouse or a loved one or children, this is a powerful, powerful tool at cutting the noise uh, in your life. All right, now last thing I wanna talk about is mindfulness, meditation, resilience, and breath work. Okay, so first and foremost, just to give us all a, a map, just a high level recap, remember that the stress response doesn't start in our body, it starts in our mind. Our mind, our reptilian mind is responsible based on our past experiences, values, and uh, everything that's in our beliefs. It's going to determine if the situation you're in is a stress response or not. So we always need to evaluate, is there something wrong with my body or is there something going on up here that I have to address? Do I need to go a little bit deeper? Because that might be the case for many people. It was certainly the case for me and certainly the case for a lot of people that we work with. So let's figure out, is it a hardware thing or is it a software thing? The mind, I would say, is the software, right? And it controls the body, controls the hardware. And we want to have full control uh, over both. So the stress response shifts our physiology into a state of fight or flight, or it shifts our physiology, if it's a relaxation response, into a state of restfulness, recovery, reproduction, resilience, all of those things, all the things that you want, all the reasons you tuned in are on the side of the parasympathetic response, the relaxation response. Okay. This is the fountain of youth, so to speak. And it's available to us through all the things that we talked about today. So mindfulness, meditation, and resilience and breath work are ways that we can tap into the system and go deeper. So I talked about some things that can remove stress in your life, right? So think of, think of your nervous system like a lake, right? And imagine there's you start throwing all these rocks and pebbles and stuff like that into the lake. That's going to be the stressors that are coming into your life, okay? And we want to be able to create and cultivate a daily practice of mindfulness. And this could be like, this could be something like journaling. You know, I use something called a five minute journal. It could be meditation and meditation could be different things for different people. Meditation for you might be playing your guitar. Meditation for you might be going for a walk in the woods. Meditation for you might be reading a book. It might be reading scripture. It might be, you know, playing with your two-year-old, whatever Give, puts you in a state of being fully present in that moment is, in my opinion, a state of meditation. It's impossible almost to shut off the mind. That's not the intention of meditation. It's to have an awareness and to be as present as you possibly can. The next thing we want to build up is resilience. Okay. So there is a term that we call equanimity, which is the ability to observe a situation and not get emotionally stirred by it. So imagine if a lake is frozen and you throw rocks in it, nothing's gonna happen. Now, I'm not saying that you need to be ice cold, but what I am saying is that it's important to cultivate a sense of resilience so that our emotions aren't swinging all over the place. And the way we build resilience is by actually putting ourselves in controlled 
uh, stressful conditions. So this is called hormesis and hormesis could be things like cold showers. So I take a cold shower every day. I finish off with about a minute of ice cold, as cold as it can go water. And what I do during that period of time is I'm working on my breath. So I'm breathing in for six seconds and I'm breathing out through my nose for six seconds. Now, what this does is it puts an immense stressor on my physical body that my mind now has to overcome. That And the bridge between my mind and my body is my breath. So I build resilience by putting my body under a stressful condition of ice cold water. And then I control with my mind, with my conscious mind, I control my breath, which allows me to build and cultivate resilience. Another form of stress that builds more resilience is exercise, right? So when we exercise, we create micro traumas, we create stress on the muscles and in the cartilage and in the, in the connective tissue and the body then repairs that and it becomes more resilient to the next time we might undergo a stressor. So what are things that you can do to build more resilience? A cold shower is a, a advanced yet super, super powerful way. For you, it might be journaling every morning for a few minutes. For some of you, it might be, hey, let me sit and sit with my breath six seconds in, six seconds out as best as I can and do that for five minutes. Maybe it means putting on some music. Maybe it means sitting outside and staring at the bark of a tree. Figure out what that is for you, but make sure it's something that you want to do, not something that I want you to do, okay? So that's the key. It's gotta be under your own volition. I'm giving you a lot of different options here. The next one is resilience. How can I put myself under some sort of controlled, stressful environment and try to build resilience? So a great way to build resilience, for example, is when you're exercising, breathe through your nose. Don't breathe through your mouth and exhale slowly when you exhale. That is a powerful way of increasing resilience to carbon dioxide. And increasing resilience to carbon dioxide uh, is a powerful predictor of longevity, but it's also a powerful predictor of your stress response. So these are some powerful tools that I've given you today. Uh, each of these slides could be an hour long uh, topic. So I hope I've given you some things to chew on and some things to process. And uh, you know, I would love to, uh, love to see if there's any questions uh, that have come in and, and anything that I can help you answer or direction that I can point you in, it would be my absolute honor. Thank you, Sachin. Um, we, when we did the registration process, we had some um, questions come in. Uh, a lot of them focused around motivation. So um, one of them was, what are your tips for maintaining motivation to adhering to routines um, and how to motivate people to motivate themselves to fit in um, workouts at home or what have you? So can you maybe talk on what some maybe suggestions are to help um, motivate people to um, what you just spoke about? Yeah, absolutely. So if we think about this from a physiological standpoint, because there's, remember, there's two parts to us. There's a hardware part and there's a software part. So there's actually two parts to this answer. So the software part is, you know, having an accountability partner, you know, having a big enough why. Why are you doing this? You know, sometimes people will use their children as the excuse some, and some people will use their children as motivation, right? Some people will say, I don't have time. I've got kids. Some people will say, listen, I've, I've got to be an inspiration for my children. And so that's a software shift, right? So we really have to figure out why it is that we're doing this. Getting an accountability partner can be extremely powerful and super helpful because it holds you accountable. It holds somebody else accountable. Now, the, the, the hardware aspect of this is neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters like dopamine are responsible for us to have uh, motivation, to feel a sense of reward, and to have the focus to complete the task that we're putting in front of ourselves. That's why getting outside in the morning is a powerful idea, even if it's not, even if it's cloudy, that increases dopamine in the body. So natural sunlight first thing in the morning increases dopamine, which gives us more reward, more focus, and it gives us more motivation to do things. Now, things that deplete dopamine, because that's important to note, is a B vitamin deficiency, specifically B6. Another thing that depletes dopamine is a deficiency in iron. Now you need healthy digestive function to absorb iron and to absorb the B vitamins. And of course, if appropriate, you may want to supplement with those. Another thing that depletes dopamine is stress. So uh, dopamine is classified as a catecholamine as is adrenaline and noradrenaline. So when we're under stress, we deplete 
our motivation neurotransmitter and reward transmitter because our instinct is to survive the situation that we're in. And I don't need to be focused on a paper that I'm writing if a lion's chasing me. I need to go into survival mode. So it's a, it's a combination usually of those two things. Foods that are high in, in dopamine, for example, or dopamine precursors would be meat. Meat has iron in it, so it's, and uh, plant-based sources of uh, iron are going to be powerful. The other thing that uh, you want to you wanna make sure you're getting enough of is protein, because uh, tyrosine is the amino acid that makes up dopamine and that comes from protein sources. So getting enough protein in the diet is important and protein digestion occurs in the stomach, which requires that we're not stressed out. So fun fact, you, the acid in your stomach is strong enough to di digest a nail. That's how powerful the acid in your stomach is. So we need our stomachs to be acidic, to break down proteins into their amino acid structures. When we're under stress, we don't make as much stomach acid. Our stomach acid is a million times more acidic than our blood. So it takes a lot of energy and it takes effort and a concerted effort of your stomach cells to, in order to be able to make stomach acid. This is why the you know, mindfulness and the breathing and the chewing before we eat is so powerful at raising our ability to digest the, the meals that we are having. Okay, thank you. Um, and another kind of theme that we're, we were getting from the questions that were submitted are, um, what are some signs of stress? So whether it's with friends or coworkers, what signs can you look for that someone might be stressed or in, in oneself if um, it's not necessarily front of mind or top of mind, but what are some signs? And is it also uh, possible that stress could be good for us too? Yeah, great question. So, you know, here's how we could clinically define, um, and even, even personally, you don't have to be a clinician to identify these things. Some of the signs and symptoms that somebody is undergoing a chronic stress response would be sensitivity to light. So sometimes you'll see people wearing sunglasses, it's not even that bright, it's cloudy and they're wearing sunglasses because when we're stressed out, our pupils dilate. So light appears brighter. Sensitivity to sounds, abnormal sensitivities to sounds, high blood pressure, uh, high blood sugar is another source that, you know, digestive problems or digestive challenges, infertility. One of the main causes of infertility is, is a chronic stress response, weight gain around the midsection, uh, especially like belly fat, the spare tire kind of, uh, uh, deposition that's usually associated to cortisol and insulin resistance. So those would be some of the physical presentations, swelling, uh, typically in the feet by the end of the day, people might uh, complain about that, that, uh, their socks leave a ring around their ankles because their feet are experiencing swelling. That's another sign. Cravings for fats, sweets, chocolates. Uh, those, those are also signs of uh, a stress response. Oh, that's great. Um, and then another question we got here was um, motivating to spend time outside, obviously with weather changing and what have you. Um, <laughs> what are some uh, tips you can suggest to motivate people to get outside, but you had, you had touched on it in your talk. Um, so if you could maybe recap the benefits of that and why it's important to ensure that you're getting outside. Okay, great question. So even if you're not like going for a walk, even sitting outside on your balcony or sitting out on your porch, getting yourself that bright exposure of sunlight, um, even if it's cloudy again, is very, very important for your mood. The other thing I want you to focus on is how you're gonna feel after. So go like, you know, a, a chess player, they usually know two to three moves ahead. So I want you to be a chess master when it comes to your, you know, your body. So you want to be a few steps ahead in your thought process as well as how am I going to feel after I do this? How am I going to feel about myself? You're going to feel a sense of accomplishment, a sense of reward, and that increases dopamine. So a lot of times motivation, uh, we have to break that cycle. We have to focus on how we're going to feel after the activity, raise that dopamine, raise that sense of reward in our body, and that's going to inspire us to do it the next day. An accountability partner is probably another way to do that. And you just have a commitment, you know, rain or shine, that we're going to, unless it's a school day that's canceled or something, rain or shine, we're going to go for a walk every day. And then you buy the equipment that you need to be able to go for a walk every day. And it becomes a, a daily habit and a daily routine. Now, for some people, I know that that's not practical. Find something else that you can do that allows you to win uh, every single day. So pick a tiny habit. It doesn't have to be committing to a one hour walk every day. That might not be practical for you right now. What's a tiny habit that you can implement that gives you those wins and then you can stack other things on top of that. 
Thank you. And then we'll just take uh, one last question here that came in. Um, can you talk more about scarce, scarcity and abundance mindset? How could we identify what we have and how to shift to that? Yeah, great. Uh, I love that topic. So people who have uh, a scarcity mindset are typically going to paint a worse future in their mind. So, you know, there's a great book and it's called Psycho Cybernetics written by Maxwell Maltz. And he was a a plastic surgeon. So what he would do is he would do plastic surgery on people and he would see their personalities transform because of how they saw themselves differently as a result of the surgeries that they had. And, and so really, really fascinating book. And what he talks about is the inside of our, of our mind's eye. So there's a theater on the inside of our, of our skull he refers to and how we visualize things is very, very important. So somebody who has a scarcity mindset generally is going to see the negative in things. They're going to be more of a, of an extractor instead of a multiplier type of mentality. They're going to be the type of person that uh, looks at something. And instead of seeing uh, abundance, they see uh, something negative. Like, let's say, let's say uh, you get an order of French fries. The person who has a scarcity mindset, they never got enough French fries. Whereas a person who has an abundance mindset is focused on, oh my God, like these French fries just magically showed up on my plate. And somebody grew this potato for me, they cooked it, they transported it, they infused it with love, and now I get to eat it and I get to digest it. So that's kind of a, a difference in what that person focuses on. Somebody with an abundance mindset is going to paint a better future for themselves. Okay, so they're going to look into the future and they're not going to paint a worse future for themselves. They're going to paint a positive future. A, a simple example is, you know, let's say we're given a canvas. And uh, Jessica, you're given a can blank canvas, I'm given a blank canvas, and we can paint on that canvas whatever we want. Okay, it takes the same amount of paint to fill that canvas, right? Different colors, different uh, shades, but the same amount of paint is required. So it's the same amount of thought that's required for us to fill our canvas of our mind. And our mind is the paintbrush. So now with our mind, I can paint whatever I want on that canvas. I can paint a beautiful, amazing life, or I can paint a miserable life for myself, right? Or a scarcity base life as a, a negative base life, or I can ba I can paint whatever I want. Right. And I can paint something beautiful. Now, here's the thing. You would never let me paint on your canvas. Would you probably not? Right. And I wouldn't let you paint on my canvas because it's my canvas. But what happens is so many of us are letting other people paint on our canvas. We're letting other people tell us what we should do or how we should do it. And it's taking away our joy. Like think about the joy that gets taken away from you, if you're painting this beautiful picture and I come and just paint whatever I'm painting on it, right? That's what's happening to a lot of us. And so we need to really uh, have an abundance mindset, focus on what we want to create because we are creating it. And there's a whole talk I do on something called cyma uh, cymatics. And literally I show the physics and the math behind how we can actually create whatever reality we want, right? Like this event was created in my mind first before it came to be right now. Right. So I had to create this vision. I had to send the email. I had to coordinate with you. Like all of these things already happened because I had an abundance mindset. If I had a scarcity mindset, I wouldn't have even sent the email. I wouldn't have even connected. That's great. Thank you. Um, we just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And thank you, Sachin, for the uh, for joining us and giving us this talk today. Um, and if all, any of our viewers are interested in additional alumni events, please visit our website at alumni.mcmaster.ca forward slash events for an up-to-date listing. And uh, again, thank you so much. And we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.